Hello. <laughs> um, my name is Chantel Dooley, and I am really grateful to the University of Arizona for hosting the Arizona Bioscience Week, and most importantly, for even having a panel to hear from the voices of the patients. Um, we all have very unique stories, and the thing that unites us all is we have all been a patient at one point in time, or will be a patient at one point in time. And um, so thank you for the opportunity to share my experience. Um, growing up, I had always thought that, you know, I was going to get married and have a great life and a great husband and great kids. And in 2016, I was well on my way to having that great life. I was engaged to marry the love of my life. Uh, Special Agent Alex Stanton, and one Friday night we were driving to meet our wedding DJ to finalize the plans for our wedding when he was killed in a motorcycle accident. Oh, and my world completely turned upside down. And I realized that it would never be the same. In 10 days, it will be eight years since he was killed, and in that time, a lot has happened. And in 2020, I decided that if I was going to have this great family, I need to build it on my own. So I started fertility treatments. I first started with IUI. I did that for three rounds, and then I did four rounds of IVF. I had picked the most perfect sperm donor. And um, after three IUIs and four IVFs, I had not one positive pregnancy test. So by January of 2023, I had given up. I was done. I kind of felt like a gambling addict, you know, like, oh, the next one will work, the next one will work. And at that point in time, I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Not only is it draining me financially, it's draining me emotionally, it reactivated a lot of grief. And it wasn't until my family, my parents, I <laughs> had um, told me, they said, you know, why don't you go get a second opinion? And so at that point, I had already leaned into adoption. I was already into my uh, adoption classes. And I just couldn't let it go that I didn't understand why it hadn't worked for me. I had developed a scary affinity for pineapple. I was on a Mediterranean diet. I was on all organic soaps and lotions and oils. And I was doing everything and taking every medical or herbal supplement that you know, any book said to take, I, I was doing it, and nothing. So I took their advice and started making appointments with as many reproductive endocrinologists as I could. And I even went international, folks, I had no shame. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I met with uh, Dr. Millie Behera of Bloom Reproductive, and she looked at me and she said, I don't know why you're not pregnant. Everything from where I'm sitting looks great. There's something else going on. We need to figure out what's going on. So we ran some more tests and they came back and she brought in Dr. Sheena Galhotra and they both sat me down and they said, look, none of these tests really tell us what's going on. We think it might be endometriosis, but that really doesn't make any sense because I've never had any symptoms of it. And she said, well, we can choose to move forward and treat it as though it is endometriosis because the test was so new and it was a faint abnormality. She said we can do medication to put you in early onset menopause and treat it that way, which sounded super fun. Or we can go in surgically and see what's up. And I said, well, the surgery option got me closer to my next round of IVF. And I said, cut me open. Let's go. So we went in for an exploratory laparoscopic procedure, and two days later, uh, Dr. Galhocha called, and she said, um, I got the results back, and it's not endometriosis. And she paused, which what felt like eternity, and here it is, I'm, in my head I'm thinking, oh God, this is it, I have cancer. And she asked, have you ever had valley fever? And I went numb. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. And she said, well, it's not endometriosis. It is valley fever. And it's everywhere. It's on your uterus. It's in your ovaries. It's on your rectum. And it's in your entire peritoneal tissue in your peritoneal cavity. 
And as she's talking, I'm thinking back 27 years ago when I was 15 and had just moved to Arizona. And we spent New Year's Day at my uncle's ranch and rode horses and pet goats and sheep. And immediately I fell sick. And my family took me to the doctor thinking I was just lethargic from being a teenager that was mad that she had to move in the middle of high school. And uh, they thought I had mono. Didn't get any better. It turned into pneumonia. After antibiotics, it still wasn't any better. And that's when the valley fever diagnosis came. Because we had just moved, we didn't have health insurance. And so the doctor that was treating me took major pity on us and was treating me in her doctor's office for IVs and antifungals. But after I got better three months later, I never thought about valley fever ever again. And every new doctor's office that you go to, you have to fill out a new patient checklist. Have you ever had this? Have you ever had that? And not one box ever asked had I ever had belly fever. I never thought about it again. So as I'm thinking through all this with Dr. Galbocher on the phone, I'm like, okay, great. I don't have cancer. Awesome. This can be fixed. What do I need to do to get pregnant? And she said, well, I don't know. But I've contacted an infectious disease specialist. I've already talked to them. They want to see you. Here's their number. You know, that's the next step. So, <clears throat> not wanting to repeat the same experience that I had with my first fertility doctor, I was like, forget this. I'm going to meet with every infectious disease specialist that will see me. So I immediately start calling and making appointments. And while I'm waiting for all these appointments to happen, I got into the research and into the literature. I'm not a medical doctor. I had no idea what I was looking for. I was looking for valley fever and this something called disseminated coccidioidomycosis that sounded really scary on Google. And I came across this author named Dr. John Galgiani of the University of Arizona, Infectious Disease. And his name kept coming up in all the research articles that I was pulling up. And then I stumbled across a website that had his email address on it and I thought, man, eh, this probably goes nowhere. So I clicked on the link and said, I got nothing to lose. So I sent him an email. Dear Dr. Don Galgiani, my name is Chantal Dooley. I have belly fever. I'm trying to get pregnant. What advice do you have? And I clicked send, <coughs> never thinking that I would ever hear from him again. 15 minutes later, my phone rang and it was him. And uh, we chatted for a little bit and he said, well, I have retired from practicing medicine. But what I would like to do is I would like to consult on your case because it's so unique. So um, he said, let me know who you work with for, as your infectious disease care provider and let's stay in touch. I ended up working and selecting Dr. Lisa Spicer of the Mayo Clinic for infectious disease and it turned out that she actually, <coughs> excuse me, that she actually worked with Dr. Galgiani and knew him. And she agreed to work with him and collaborate with him. But then the other thing that she asked me is for the phone number of my fertility specialists. So that way she could call them and find out how the best way would be to treat me because I wanted to get pregnant. So I go in and meet with Dr. Galgiani. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I go in to meet with Dr. Galgiani, and um, I walked into his office and he said, I already talked to Dr. Behera and Dr. Galhotra, I've spoken with Dr. Spicer, you know, I learned this, I learned that, and this is a treatment plan that we would like to try. What do you think? The reason I'm sharing this is because I am so grateful for the providers that I have because they took the time to call each other and have independent conversations outside of their network of care. They didn't have to take the call, they didn't have to make the call, and they didn't have to spend the time reviewing my file and collaborating with each other to figure out the best way to move forward for me. They did that all on their own. Um, there's a quote by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, and she says that nothing great ever happens between the hours of nine to five and Monday through Friday. And that is really, really true. Because as providers, <coughs> you all have a lot to do in the work hours that you have. And then there's probably, you know, documenting patient notes and 
and writing down exactly what happened and calling this person back and refilling this prescription, but they still took the time to make sure that my treatment plan was right for me and that they were taking care of the reason that I was seeking and in need of treatment. And I will really, really forever be grateful for that. Um, I've been on treatment now for 16 months and the valley fever is still active in my peritoneal cavity and I will not be able to have children. Um, despite all of this, I am really inspired by the level of care that I have been given from the team that has been working with me. And um, it's really important not only for patients, but also for providers to share your story with why you want to get treatment. So many of us forget that we have a choice whether or not we want to get treated or not. And it's why do you want treatment? Why do you want to get better? And it's that's the piece that makes us human, that separates us from what's in the textbook and what's not in the literature, or maybe what isn't yet in the literature. So share your why, and most importantly, surround yourself with those that are on the same mission as you. Build your personal contact connections and network with other providers who are experts in areas that you might not be experts in. Because when you have those unique instances for your patients, you can call on your colleagues and truly collaborate and make the voice of the patient even stronger. So thank you.